of the podcast. I'm hanging out with Bart Watson, Chief Economist for Brewers Association. How are you doing? Good. Thanks for having me. Oh, thanks for thanks for coming on. Um, just listened to you do a keynote speech. Fantastic. Thank you. So I'm going to ask all the same questions. You're going to be like, were you not listening? Yeah. But, but I was listening. I was busy jotting down questions as you chatted. Um, first of all, let's talk about the Brewers Association. Explain what it is and what their role is for the industry. Yeah, Brewers Association is the U.S. National Trade Association. So uh, our mission is to promote and protect small and independent brewers. Um, you know, we do so through stats and data. That's what I do. Um, government affairs and technical resources. And uh, because of, you know, there's technical resources and some of the other stuff we do, we, we do have a fair number of Canadian members as well. Um, so, yeah. You were saying um, 25 Alberta breweries? Yeah, 25 mm -hmm. when I polled, you know, and, and more, you know, others who have been members in the past. So, yeah. you know, I think Alberta brewers would join because, you know, technical resources that we have for our members or, or stats and data. Um, obviously, there are, you know, a fair number of similarities between the U.S. market and the Canadian market. So, you know, while we're mostly focused on U.S. You know, market statistics, I think they could, they could be applicable for, for Canadian brewers as well. So what I loved about what you were doing this morning is, you know, a lot of these people uh, that own breweries, you know, they started breweries because they had a passion to make beer. Um, and then you realize kind of as you keep, as you go and as your, as your business matures, it's like you need to know more than just the making of the beer. There's a, there's a real business behind it. And then, you know, that business is part of an overall industry. Um, and so you were really good at breaking down kind of, you know, what, you know, some of the numbers were, but also what they mean for the, for the individual breweries. Like I said, it's, it's a real skill to take what you know, but then to be able to communicate it to people effectively. So I'm guessing that's why they, uh, uh, make you come to all these things. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, that's, that's my role is to give that macro perspective and, you know, I mean, brewers, brewers are going to know better, about what's going on in their business and their day-to-day -day than I ever can. But what I can do is I can aggregate those stories um, and I can try to give them context and, and also help, you know, maybe, you know, see some of the things that might be coming up because, you know, we do have, we have historical trends we can look at. We, you know, we know as, as businesses mature, you know, what those trends look like. So, um, you know, that's, that's my role for our brewery members is to try to give them context, try to give them, you know, food for thought. And, and hopefully, you know, I, I'm not going to be the person who makes them brew better beer. We do have people who do that, but, um, you know, within the context, you know, run a better business because they're, they're thinking about some of this stuff and they understand where their business sits in the industry. Absolutely. I'm not sure if this is the right way to frame it, but it was the way I was thinking about it because, um, obviously COVID and I hate to even talking about COVID, but it was, it was one of those things that kind of, you know, change the way things were going. And so what I was curious about was, you know, when we look at it, say pre-COVID, COVID, and then post-COVID, when you look at the industry, what were kind of some of the trends that you were seeing before COVID impacted us? I think it's a great way to think about it because, you know, there was some stuff too that it didn't change that, mm -hmm. you know, was going to happen anyway. And, you know, I always try to be careful as much as possible to, to pull those things apart because, you know, if we understand what was already a trend that, you know, even COVID couldn't disrupt it, I think it helps us understand, you know, where we might be going. And, you know, for example, I think the brewery number is a good example. It was already slowing pre-COVID. Um, right. And so, you know, maybe COVID changed this. It certainly changed it for individuals, you know, that, oh, we were going to open, but then COVID hits and, couldn't get the financing or that location didn't make sense or, you know, whatever it was. Um, but, you know, we were already seeing the brewery opening number, for example, decline pre-COVID. We had a maturing market. It was, you know, the number of breweries wasn't going to go up forever, um, right. you know, as much as we all would, would love that. Um, you can't have every business in a country be, be a brewery. Um, so I think that's a good <laughs> example of one that, I mean, when you look at it as a line, and, and hopefully I showed that in my talk well, you know, you can show where COVID is and it doesn't really look like it affected it at all. Um, it did on the closing side. I mean, you can see that little spike when COVID hit, right. you know, in terms of closings, but on openings, it, it didn't really affect the trend that much. And I think that gives us, helps give us perspective around, you know, what we're going through now as a maturing industry that, you know, this isn't just COVID. It was part of a bigger, longer term trend. And, and so we need to, you know, we need to accept that and be aware of that as we, as we plan going forward. And then, so COVID, what were some of the trends that were affected by COVID? Yeah. I mean, the biggest, you know, one off the bat is, is just where we bought beer. Yeah. So, you know, overnight, we stopped going to bars and restaurants, you know, again, some by mandate, some by preference. Um, and so, you know, draft beer just, you know, takes this immediate huge hit, which is tough for breweries because A, they sell draft beer at their tap rooms and brew pubs and, and B, they sell a lot of, of draft beer. I mean, in, in the U.S., about 30 percent of the draft market is craft versus only, you know, let's say eight to 10 percent of the packaged beer market. 
Um, so that, you know, that was a huge one where we just, you know, we didn't stop drinking beer. We drank yeah. about the same amount of beer, but we drank it in radically different places. And, you know, since then we've been kind of playing catch up where you see, you know, these waves and, and kind of that tide rolling back. Um, but, you know, COVID changed that. And, and along with it, it changed the landscape of, of where we buy beer. So, you know, bars and restaurants did not make it through COVID unscathed, many closed. Um, and so, you know, we, we, we saw not only kind of a different retailer landscape, but different consumer behaviors as well to go in delivery, which, you know, we're already part of the landscape, but, you know, certainly saw a boost and, you know, people built new patterns. Yeah. You know, we're, we're, we're pattern recognition creatures and, and we, you know, we took on new patterns during COVID and some of those stuck. And, and that's the thing that I always think about is, you know, there was this idea, um, that, you know, once, once the economy opened up again and you were able to do things like things would just go back to normal, but because as humans, we, we get into habits, right? And so you can't just be like, Oh, okay. Uh, what I've been doing for the last year, I'm going to stop doing, and I'm going to go back to what I was doing previous. So, so the idea that, you know, there's going to be changes and some are going to be permanent. Yeah, exactly. You know, I mean, examples could be, you know, how you buy your groceries, mm -hmm. you know, maybe, maybe you learn like, oh, the, the click and collect, you know, that works really well for me and my family. And right. I would never have tried that without COVID, but COVID was the impetus to try that. And, right. and so now it's, you know, something that, you know, maybe I don't do every day, right. I still run into a store now that stores are reopened and I feel comfortable, but you know, I still do click and collect, um, some, so, you know, that's part of, you know, in, in contextualizing this for the beer industry, you know, one of the stats I was giving is, you know, draft sales are, are still down below where they were. And, you know, there's a whole bunch of little reasons for that, but you know, some of it is people just develop new patterns of how they buy stuff. Yeah. Um, and, and some of those are going to be sticky. So it was funny. I was just, after you were done talking, I was, I was, uh, chatting with some of the, the, uh, breweries and Alberta is such a, like a relatively young craft beer industry. And so a lot of them, they didn't really have a lot of data pre COVID, like they opened just before COVID. So it's, it's really interesting seeing your numbers because, um, they don't really have numbers of their own to kind of go with. And so a lot of their historical data is what was happening through COVID. Um, so for you then, what are you seeing as we kind of come out of this? Um, what do you see as, are things slowly getting back to what they were? Um, like you were mentioning, obviously, um, can product is down, keg product is up. Um, was that to be expected? Yeah, you know, to a certain extent, yeah, you know, it was to be expected, right? Because we were we were normalizing back, and you know, I think what we're starting to see now is is we're starting to get to that you know new normal, which is a phrase you know we used a lot of a year ago. Uh, but we're starting to get to a place where the patterns are a little bit more consistent, where, you know, keg beer has come back up, but it's still below where it was. And I think we're starting to get to the point where we have enough data where we can say it's going to stay there for a while. Um, so, you know, it really depends on the trend and, and what you're looking at. But I think we're starting to see that we've we've come out. We have our new patterns. You know, we're in a place where maybe there are a few people, right, who, who are still shifting their, their behavior based on COVID. I think we all know a few of those people are still being really COVID cautious. Um, you know, but 95, 99% of people are, are kind of in the patterns they're going to be in in life um, now. And so we're starting to see if we watch these trends that, you know, kind of on a macro level, we're, we're now back, you know, bars and restaurant sales are kind of static again, you know, relative to inflation. Um, you know, those beer sales kind of look like they're, they're stabilizing in packaged form. So we're back kind of where we're going to be. One of the things that I thought was interesting, um, you were talking about how you know, like when the craft beer industry is kind of new and fun and sexy liquor stores, you know, they might, you know, take a chance and order, a, a, you know, a bunch from here and here. And, and they're kind of like, you know, learning like, oh, but at a certain point, you know, they start simplifying. And, and was that a, like, was that something that you saw, you know, maybe liquor stores doing over COVID was, okay, we can't just keep getting you know, we have to have a system. We have to have a. We have to simplify things, and then also too, from a restaurant perspective. Well, maybe we don't need twenty draft lines. Maybe we just need you know six really good ones. Because if we're going to be closing down, it's easier to close down six than it is twenty. So, do you see some of those um, changes kind of maybe staying permanent? I, I do, um, and and you know, I we can separate these two. You know, on the package side. You know, we definitely saw people try to simplify during COVID, you know, and that initial kind of 
boost of sales too. I mean, keeping stuff in stock was really challenging for a lot of retailers because everybody, I mean, you know, myself included, you know, when you need your, you know, apocalypse, you know, supply bunker, you know, you got to have beer. And <laughs> oh, so, yeah. and so, so, you know, everybody rushed and they bought lot, lots more stuff. So keeping stuff in stock was a challenge. And I think a lot of retailers, what they saw is they needed to simplify it to, to manage that. And, you know, I think when then they looked at their sales and said, well, our sales are, are fine, even with the simplification and it saves us time and it saves us money. Um, and, you know, and as we've moved kind of as those package sales have come back down, you know, I think a lot of retailers have kept some of those lessons as well as, you know, seeing craft sales, you know, stagnate a little bit as, right. the, as the market's matured that they've asked themselves, you know, how can I how can I make more money selling the same amount of beer? And, you know, one answer has been simplification. And, you know, again, some of that's not craft being craft's not new and shiny anymore. And so, you know, there's still plenty of variety out there, right? Like we're yeah. not talking about it going from a hundred to one products. We're talking about going from a hundred to 95 or to 90 products right. where there's still plenty of variety. Um, you know, but that's going to be challenging for, for some. And, and on the restaurant side, you know, I think we've seen, you know, again, simplification is, is something that retailers want um, that we, you know, prior to COVID, we were really in that boom of taps. How many can I add? And, you know, <laughs> oh, yeah. And that, that was what defined a, a restaurant in a lot of ways is like, you know, oh, this one has 30, but this one has 50. And that was kind of what distinguished the two, right? Yeah. And I think, you know, restaurateurs looked at those numbers, you know, I mean, again, it sharpens the mind when your sales are down and you, you know, you got to make ends meet. And I think a lot of restaurateurs looked at that and said, Hey, you know, we're not, we're not selling a lot of beer from the 45th through 50th tap. So maybe yeah. we can take those off and we can save a little bit of money on inventory and, you know, line cleaning and, you know, just, you know, all the things that go into maintaining that system. Um, and Hey, you know, our sales are, are still looking okay. And, and so we're going to keep this and, and not go back to where we were. So one of the things that I thought was really interesting is, and I, I do ask this a lot of, of breweries when I'm chatting with them, which is their distribution model, because I feel like, um, in Alberta, let's say five years ago, 10 years ago, when, when, uh, we were really seeing an uptick in breweries, you know, you could start a brewery and then you could kind of decide what your distribution model was going to be. Whereas now I think you have to have that pretty dialed in, you know, when you, when you open. Um, so what I wrote down was if, if you think about it in three ways, so, you know, packaged good, kegged goods, and then, you know, stuff that you sell from the brewery. Um, so what would you say as far as a brewery, like if you were to open up a brewery right now, what, what would you say is like the, the ideal model? Is there one? I don't think there's one ideal model, um, but, you know, there are different risk models, okay. and, you know, how much you're willing to invest, how much you're willing to risk, you know, what do you want to be? Um, you know, I think the, the distribution model is becoming more challenging, more competitive, riskier. You know, the further you send your beer away from your brewery, the more, the less you control it and, you know, the more variables there are. So, um, you know, I think we still see a lot of success in the, I sell most of my beer from my brewery. Right. Um, that's, you know, you control the taps. No, if, if you're worried about tap handles getting cut from 50 to 30, yeah. if you own the taps, then you control that. Um, so you know your beer is going to stay on tap. Um, you know, similarly, you know, with packaged beer, if, if they're cutting the shelf set, you know, if, you, if you're selling it from your cooler, um, you can make sure your beer stays in the cooler. Um, you know, I think we also see that's still a model that you know, customers like. Um, you know, will that last forever? Uh, I don't know. Um, but I think that's, that's the place where we still see, you know, we still see growth. We still see, um, kind of opportunity. The challenge there, right. Is that doesn't scale as much. So, right. you know, if your if your goal is to sell a lot of beer and have, you know, everybody in Calgary or Edmonton or, or all of Alberta drink your beer, you can't do that from a tap room. Exactly. Um, so, you know, going bigger creates more opportunity, but it creates a lot more risk. And, you know, I think we're seeing a lot of brewers realize that, you know, the model works for them um, at, at a small level, that that risk of distribution, the additional costs that it takes isn't worth it um, and and scale back and focus a little bit more. And, I, you know, I think we see a lot of brewers kind of land in between where they are doing some distribution, but it's it's limited. It's almost marketing as much as it is for the sales, right? right? When I'm on tap and the restaurants are on, it's like, oh, yeah, I should I should go check out that place. I should go ch see their tap room. Um, and that's not the thing that's driving the numbers of the business as much as just kind of keeping that brand al alive and out there. And then that leads to almost a, a conflict in that, you know, if um, and I've seen it play out a little bit in, in Alberta where all of a sudden the brewery is seen as a competitor because it's like, well, why would I have his beer or her beer on tap when, you know, they their brewery's 
five blocks that way and they're they're stealing customers from me so so how do you how do you see um those i guess is there any way to avoid that yeah, I don't think there's a way to avoid that, but there are ways to be conscious of it and make sure you're not, you know, you're not making that a liability. Um, you know, have conversations with those bar owners. If you're selling, you know, draft beer to the market, have conversations with the bar owners and, you know, talk to them about ways that, that it can work for both of you. Um, you know, make sure that, you know, you're not, I don't know what the rules on this are, but, you know, in, in Canada, but in the U.S., you know, one thing you hear from brewers all the time is, I want to make sure my, my place is the most expensive place to buy my beer in town. Um, uh-huh. you know, which can be a little counterintuitive, but then you're saying to the bar owners, I'm not going to undercut you. Right. Cause I know you have additional costs and, you know, um, and, and that's a way you can say to bar owners, look, you know, we're, we're in this together. Um, I want you to sell, uh, my beer. You want to sell my beer and we're going to find ways to make sure that, that that happens in a way that, that I'm not a competitor to you. Um, and, and, you know, I think a lot of this too relates to the, the brewer and the brand and, you know, where they are in their community. I mean, if you're a, if you're a good community steward and you're doing events in the community and you know you're you're doing the things that that raise that community up that the the bar owner or the liquor store owner is in, you know, they're I think they're going to be much more likely to see you as a partner. Yeah. You know, even if you know, yes, you, maybe you're competing a little bit on the beer side. So I, I think there are things you can do, but there's going to be a natural tension there. There's only so much yeah. beer to be drunk in the world, and if they're drinking it at your place, they're not drinking it elsewhere. And and that's where just you know understanding who you are, having those conversations, I think, go a long way to to helping breweries do that well. So a few challenges um, outside of COVID. Um, so taxes is one. I I hear, you know, continuously that regardless of, it almost seems like no matter what's happening in the world, uh, beer taxes are always going up. And I think in Canada, actually, I think it's like, I think it's actually like, it just is an automatic increase on a yearly basis. Um, as an association, uh, are there things that you do to work with government to maybe educate them on, on why, you know, increasing taxes isn't always the best thing to do? Yeah, certainly. Um, you know, that's one of our, our primary roles. I mean, we do that mostly at the federal level and then work with various, you know, state associations at the state level. And very proud that in the U.S. at the federal level, um, you know, we roll back uh, federal excise taxes. So they were $7 a barrel, uh, up to 60,000 barrels for, for U.S. brewers, and they're now three fifty. Uh, so we got that cut in half at the federal level, and, and those have been made permanent. Um, you know, and, and the story we tell is, you know, is one of total economic opportunity. Um, you know, at the end of the day, yes, excise taxes is part of government revenue, but so are all those other business taxes that these yeah. breweries pay. And having healthy job-creating businesses in the long run is is going to be much better for government coffers than, you know, making a little bit more from this one specific excise tax, which, you know, excise taxes play a role. Um, and, you know, in public health and, and controlling problem drinking, but that's not at the price points that, you know, craft brewers are at, you know, craft right. brewers are, are selling to, you know, a, a place where the excise tax is, is not the thing that's going to deter consumption one way or the other. It's going to pull money out of that business owner that they could be reinvesting in their businesses. So, you know, we try to tell the opportunity story, the job creation story, that total business story, and, you know, and show policymakers a healthy and thriving business community. Uh, for breweries in your region is going to be one that that's much better than making a little bit more in excise tax on the front end. You had an interesting perspective on inflation as well. So um, obviously inflation is um, and in Canada for sure is, uh, is, is crazy gas prices. You were mentioning barley prices up, I think 45% or something like that. Um, so, but you were also saying that it doesn't have as much of an impact on the consumer as we might think. Can you explain that? Sure. And, and this is not to say broadly, right? Inflation can have an impact on the consumer. But when we focus in on on beer specifically and then craft beer within that, you know, we're talking about, you know, very different things. So, you know, why don't we just have data on this? That historically, when inflation has been high, it hasn't, it hasn't pulled on beer sales that much. Um, craft drinkers in general are a little bit more insulated from inflationary pressures. They already tend to be a little bit higher socioeconomic status, so they're probably a little bit um, better able to, to weather this. Um, you know, inflation is also not, it, inflation in and of itself isn't the challenge. It's how it erodes people's purchasing power. So people have less money in their pocket. But if those wages are going up too, you know, and we see real wages in, in Canada haven't dropped that much yet, um, you know, that, that that can offset that. Um, so, so it's a little bit more complicated than saying, you know, inflation bad equals low beer sales. And when we start pulling it apart, we see that, yeah, you know, it, it might have a place, you know, so think about the gas station, uh, where, you know, also has a liquor store next door and, you know, 
somebody used to, you know, buy gas and now they have a little bit less money and so they don't make that stop at the liquor store. Um, you know, yes, that, that's a customer story, but for a lot of people, it's not the only one. And, and for the craft customer, that's probably not a trade-off that a lot of them are facing, at right. least yet. And, and so, you know, that's, I think, less of a worry for, for craft customers than, you know, some other competition within the beverage alcohol market that, you know, they're going to, they have fewer hard-earned dollars and how are they choosing to spend those? It seems like to me, and when I look at the data, a more important factor than the inflation itself. So do you see that people might choose a less expensive option? Is that something that you see? Yeah. Or, you know, I mean, here, here, here's an example. They might choose to, to drink the beer at a different place. Um, buying a four pack or a six pack of beer is a lot cheaper than going to a bar and, and buying right. that same volume. Um, so is it, you know, less beer sold? No, but you know, it's a different place that it's sold. Um, you know, so that's a place we might see it. People, you know, going out a little bit less, yeah. um, and, and shifting some of the volume to, to packaged away from draft. Um, you know, we haven't seen any evidence of the other, you know, example you gave of trade down of people buying less expensive beer. And I think again, that's, you know, why are people buying the brand of beer that they're buying? They have an affinity to that brand. They, you know, they want that specific thing. You know, it, yes, if there's a substitute that's, you know, two bucks cheaper, you know, maybe maybe they'll do it. Um, but, you know, somebody who wants this specific IPA with the specific hop they like, are they going to trade down to, you know, a, a macro lager? Um, right. Probably not, right? You know, they're not going to buy that beer or they're, um, you know, or, or they're still going to buy it. They're going to find a way to, to afford it in their budget. So, you know, some things are substitutes, but it doesn't mean that it's necessarily, you know, everything's going to be. And I think we're going to see this more at the low end of the beer market. And we've seen this over time, right? So, you know, perfect example of this is not inflation specific, but price specific is we've seen beer lose share to, to hard liquor in recent years. And I think a lot of that's price that beer has held price and liquor has gotten cheaper. And so people who were drinking macro lager are buying, you know, handles of vodka. Um, <laughs> and, but that's not the craft customer. And, right. and that, you know, craft through this whole period has, has continued to take share because it's different, it's differentiated and, and people are willing to pay a little bit more for those brands. So supply chains, cause I know when I talk to breweries, you know, there's, especially over the last couple of years, the concerns of even getting the raw materials, um, cans, like has been huge. Um, how is that, you know, how have you seen that kind of affect the industry in the last little while? It's been hugely challenging. Um, and, you know, we've seen it in different ways, you know, kind of three buckets that I would, I would put things in. You know, one is things where demand just spiked during the pandemic. And, and a perfect example we're drinking from aluminum cans right now is aluminum cans. Yeah. That... You know, again, overnight, we stopped going to bars and restaurants and we ran to the package store. <laughs> yeah. And so just as a society, we suddenly needed more cans yeah. and you know, nobody was ready for this. Nobody was like, well, we should, you know, have, you know, billion cans in reserve because suddenly we're going to need a lot more cans. And so can prices shut up and can availability went down. Um, and, and luckily, you know, that's abated as we've started to go back to bars and restaurants and buy, you know, less packaged beer. Um, you know, the second thing are, are things that just got disrupted. You know, the, the global supply chains got messed up by COVID, um, you know, A, because we needed more stuff and we were trying to jam stuff through the same system and, and B, you know, supply and demand got, got messed up. But also there were just shutdowns at ports and you know, <laughs> other countries and where we made stuff. You know, I think we're also starting to see that that come back down. You know, prices are, are still higher than they were, but, you know, containers and, and rail and freight is starting to come back down. So we're starting to see a little bit more balance there. You know, not like it, like it was, but you know, it's starting to get better. And then, and then the third big bucket is climate, uh, climate change, uh, which I think we're starting to see hit the beer supply chain. Um, we had a terrible barley crop last year in 2021 in both the U.S. and Canada that was brought on by unprecedented heat and drought yeah. um, across. You know, and and we'd had heat and drought in both Canada and the U.S. And I think what was unprecedented is how big this area was that it was affecting across you know very different growing regions and. Um, you know, that led barley prices to spike and, and translated into malt. And, you know, on a lesser extent, we're seeing similar stuff in hops this year. That the, the German and, you know, Czech hop growing regions just got crushed by, you know, hot and dry summers. And, um, you know, and so that's one, you know, brewers, are, that one is more lasting, I think. We're, you know, uh, luckily this year we've seen a much better barley crop, you know, right. here in Alberta and, and, and in North America generally. Um, but that's one we're, we're going to have to watch because that's a disruption that has nothing to do with COVID. Um, and that we're probably going to see more and more on an ongoing basis. And then one I didn't think about um, is the aging population. So as people get older, they you basically said once people retire, it's kind of like <laughs> their beer consumption goes or the amount that they spend goes goes down. Yeah. Um, and overall in North America, we're seeing a, 
an aging population overall. Is that right? Yeah. Um, and yeah, you, you've highlighted the kind of two effects. One is people tend to drink a little less beer as they get older. Um, you know, I, maybe I should have hit this more in the talk. There's an opportunity to change that, right? You know, 10 years ago, you know, the classy drink as you got older to, you know, bring to your boss's house for a, you know, dinner party was a bottle of wine. And, yeah. and that's not true anymore. You can bring, you know, something that's equally sophisticated from, from the beer category. Um, you know, so, so that's one piece of it. And two, people just tend to spend a little bit less as they get older. Um, so you actually see, you know, as people get older, you, until they retire, you see these kind of two counteracting effects where they drink a little bit less, but they spend a little bit more on, on what they're drinking, right. um, which is, you know, I think generally good for craft. And then they hit 65 and income goes down and, you know, your ability to process alcohol goes down and, and both those things go down <laughs> where you drink less and you spend less on it. Um, and you know, that's going to be a challenge. Um, you know, luckily the good news for Alberta craft brewers is that the Alberta population is growing. Um, and so even if you have an aging population, the total population of, of kind of prime working age or, uh, beverage alcohol consumption is still going to go up, but it's going to be a real challenge for, you know, the, the baby boomers, um, you know, huge generation post-World War II, they're, they're exiting the workforce now. They're going to stop drinking soon. And it's going to be a huge transition for, I think, beverage alcohol makers in a lot of places. And we've seen it other places already. Yeah. You know, you look globally at this, you know, the Japanese are running campaigns to try to convince young people to drink. And, um, you know, Japanese beer companies, one reason they're buying, you know, uh, you know, Sapporo and Sleeman, you know, operates here in Canada. One reason they're doing that is because of demographic decline and they need to find new markets that, that are growing. Wow. Um, you were saying, we were talking about the economy and, and you're saying that really as a, as a, individual business you shouldn't worry about the economy which seems like it, it it seems counterintuitive but why should one not worry about the economy yeah hopefully i gave two good reasons uh the first is you can't do anything about it you know th yeah. this is not something the average business owner has any influence over right the economy is big multifaceted and and you know you're, you're not going to affect and so you know yes you should be aware of it but you know worrying about it is is something something different um, and hopefully I give lots of stats and data, too, that, you know, higher inflation, recession haven't had huge effects on beer sales. You know, obviously, if we get the, the next Great Depression, you know, all bets are off. But it, nobody is projecting that, right? They're projecting economic slowdown as we, we see rising interest rates. Um, you know, the second piece was that I think it affects the beer industry less than, than people think. Um, and so we talked about inflation already. We see similar things with the recession data that hasn't had huge effects on beer sales that, you know, this is not the primary place. And you know, around the edges, right, there might be shifts. So people might go out to eat a little bit less and they might buy a little more packaged beer. And that's the kind of thing a brewer should think about, not necessarily yeah. worry about. Um, and then, you know, the final thing to say is too, I think there's lots of other things to worry about right now. <laughs> you know, you only got so much space in your brain to worry about these challenges and, and thinking about your brands and your competitive place in the industry is probably a much better spot to spend that, you know, limited bandwidth. Right. And, and the other thing that I thought was interesting is because when you think about the economy, you know, you're looking at it from a grand scale, but really as a, as a small craft brewer, you should almost be looking at it more as like a micro economy. Like what does your neighborhood look like? And, and, you know, if you're distributing just within your neighborhood, then really focus on that. Right. Yeah. You know, if you're, if you're a brewery that, you know, uh, oil workers go to, you know, the total economy is irrelevant to you. The, the price of oil and, you know, what, what they're doing there matters way, way more. Right. Um, and, you know, hopefully that specific example illustrates kind of the broader point, which is your customers are not the generic, you know, uh, economic actor in this in this story. You know, you need to think about your neighborhood, your customers, and you know that could be booming while one other part of the economy is is struggling. And you know, another example I gave in the talk is just thinking about economic geography right now. That you know, downtown areas are clearly still a little bit depressed. You know, yeah. via pre-COVID, we're all still working some days from our you know our living rooms. Um, and for a suburban brewer, that might be great. You might actually have more customers now than you had before. Um, and so those kind of localized trends, uh, both in the economy and in, in consumer patterns, are going to matter much, much more than, you know, what's the unemployment rate in Canada? Is your relevance if it's 2% in your town or 10% in your town? Right, absolutely. So growth, if, if I have this correct, if you look at it overall, growth is still happening, but it's, it's happening slower. Is yeah, that right? In exa terms exactly. of number of breweries opening, in terms of consumption, that sort of thing? Yeah, that's that's right. You know, that we're seeing we're still seeing growth in craft, but it's much slower than it was in terms of both number of breweries and production. You know, and I think we're starting to reach that point too where we need to think less about the overall numbers and we also need to think about growth per brewery. Um, you know, you can get growth. Is that enough growth to support everyone? Um, right. you know, is a separate question. 
Um, so, you know, we're still seeing, we're still seeing demand growth. That's the good news. Uh, we're still seeing the number of breweries grow, but how long that is going to last, I think is an open question. And, and whether that's enough growth for every brewery to be successful, I think is also a separate question. Yeah. Um, I'm, I'm not quoting you here. I'm paraphrasing you, but, um, you're, you're saying that when you get asked by reporters and stuff, they'll, they'll say, you know, maybe they'll see that a brewery closes and they'll they'll point to that as an indication that the, the bubble is bursting. Um, but, I, but I think you were saying that that isn't an indication. Maybe explain what, what that means. Yeah, I think we've thought about, you know, a lot of people have worried that the last 10 years is some kind of bubble. And, and I fundamentally disagree with that. You know, we've seen this just shift in the way that, you know, Canadians drink beer. Um, you know, they drink more local beer. They drink it from different places. They, you know, are willing to pay a little bit more. They like fuller flavor. Um, so, you know, what we've seen in this growth in the number of breweries has been, you know, real demand driven growth that customers want more of this beer. And so there's been more economic opportunity. Similarly, as we start to see, you know, a few more breweries close and, and fewer open, this is not a bubble bursting a, cause we didn't have a bubble and B because this is normal. This is, this is the normal market that you would see in almost anything else. You know, if you look at restaurants, nobody yeah. expects restaurants only to open. Um, or, you know, pick your hospitality industry, because that's what a lot of breweries are. I mean, yeah. when they're localized and they're, they're serving most of their, making most of their money, serving beers over the bar, they're, they're a hospitality. We expect that openings and closings are roughly in balance. And so what we're seeing is we're seeing us move into a, a quote unquote normal industry, finally, yeah. uh, a more mature one. And we're moving out of that kind of crazy, the weird period was the last 10 years where everyone opened, no one closed. It was only success rates. Like that doesn't happen. And right. I don't know the Canadian numbers as well, but you know, in the U S you can look at this via uh, small business administration loans given out to, to small businesses and breweries literally had the highest success rate of any industry in the United States it, over a decade period. So that's the weird thing that breweries are closing now is, is normal. It's not a bubble bursting. It's not that this is going away. Again, we have demand growth still. People yeah. still want to drink these beers it's us moving into a, a normal world, which is it going to be as nice and fun for the brewery owners as a world where everyone opened and no one closed? No. Yeah. Um, but that doesn't mean that things are collapsing or that this, you know, this, this trend is going away. And I think that, and I've seen it, you know, I've been lucky enough to, to watch a lot of, you know, I've, you know, we started doing festivals uh, almost 20 years ago in, in Alberta. Um, so I've, I've, I've seen the craft beer industry, you know, grow um, so I've, I've really got to, you know, watch a lot of these people start and, and what I'm seeing is a real maturing of, of the industry. So, you know, I, we were talking before we hit record where, you know, a lot of these guys and ladies, they, they, they started because they had a passion for making beer. Um, not all of them thought about it as a business per se. Right. So all these things that we're talking about are kind of like the layers that like, you have to start, it's like, okay, the passion is there and that's great, but now it's a business and, and you have all these other things. So, you know, that's really, and, and to your point, that's, that's what we're seeing is, is it's a business, it's an industry and in industries, people succeed and people fail and people don't look at a restaurant and say, look, that one closed. Therefore we can see that the collapse of the restaurant industry, right? Like they don't, Whereas in, in the beer industry, I feel like they do make that connection, right? And it, and it's just not the case. Yeah, exa exactly. And you know, we're moving into an era where those business dynamics are going to matter more. And it's going to be it's going to be on just, you know, did you make great beer? Were you passionate about it? You know, how are your debt levels? Did you, you know, I mean, basics of business that, you know, the brewery owners are going to have to to not just know, but, you know, thrive in and, yeah. and running that business side. And, you know, that's okay. Ho hopefully we can keep the passion. We can keep the excitement while, you know, kind of building some of those mature business skills um, in at the same time. Yeah, but it's it's, it's going to be a different era. And, and you know, sometimes that also means different owners. I mean, I think we've, we've seen this certain amount too. We've seen some turnover in the ownership of breweries. And that's not always a bad thing, right? The, yeah. the owner who can get a business to a certain point is not always the owner who can, you know, keep it going or, or take it to that next point. And, and, and that's also, you know, fine and not a sign that anything's collapsing as much as just we're entering a new era. Yeah. It's actually interesting because I was having that conversation a while ago with somebody. It's a, it's almost the difference between, you know, there's a, there's an entrepreneur mentality, but then there's a business person mentality and, and, and those are, those are often different people. And so, yeah, like an entrepreneur might be the person to start the brewery and bring it to a certain level, but then you need somebody else to kind of take it from there. It's an established proven concept and really either continue to grow it or, you know, to just make it a successful business. So it, it's, it's okay that, 
that the ownership changes sometimes. Yeah, and I, I think you can you can see this even better too if you step back even further. You know, twenty years ago or thirty years ago, like to open a brewery, you had to kind of be crazy. Um, you know, I mean, it, you still it, do kind of, don't you? Kind of, but I mean, you know, thirty years ago, it made no business sense to open a brewery. I mean, there was no market. You were gonna, you know, you're gonna be doing <laughs> this true. kind of, you know, yeah. all yourself. And you know, we go five years ago. Yeah, I mean, you see the trends. It's growing. It makes you know some sense. You know, sure, you're getting in for a passion. Um, but you know, 30 years ago was a totally different era and the skill set you needed to, to persevere and to be that crazy person out there, you know, talking about the market and why you should drink this, you know, beer that's not just the, the same old beer that we've all been drinking for two generations. Um, you know, it was a very different skill set than it was five years ago when, when things were booming and a very different skill set than it is now. And, you know, this, the best breweries are ones that are going to, you know, bring in those new pieces of knowledge that they need or, you know, or are already set up and already thinking about these things. So, and I, I, I think that's, a hundred percent correct. And what I think is hilarious is I remember, so I would have been too young to drink when Big Rock opened. Um, but you know, when I was in, even in, let's say high school university and I was, I was experiencing Big Rock for the first time and it was completely the opposite of what people in general drank. Right. So not only did they open in an industry where they were like the complete underdogs, they were making products that nobody was even in a way asking for and they were really educating the consumer so um yeah it was it was such a such an interesting business model in a way because it was so counterintuitive for them to be doing that right but without that and then one thing that i find interesting though is i think craft brewers are doing a better job now that so many of those products, you know, you have the IPAs and you have the porters and stouts and, and all these that, you know, people have acquired a taste for. And now they are going to the loggers and, uh, and, the, and, um, and giving consumers, you know, a, a craft example of those traditional beers, which I think is really smart, too. Yeah, that's one of the, you know, uh, the, the, the craft lager is the next big thing has been, you know, the people have been talking about craft lager is the next big thing for 20 years. Yeah. You know, that it's always like, oh, maybe that's on the horizon, but, you know, maybe and maybe now is finally the time as the, the market matures a little bit and craft brewers, you know, figure out what's next. You know, it's it's worth remembering that that's still the vast majority of the beer market. Yeah. Um, you know, uh, we can live in our own little craft bubble and think it's all IPAs and, um, you know, stouts all the way down. But you know, still the vast majority of beer that is, is drunk in, in North America is, you know, is, is lager. Um, and, and that's a place that if craft brewers can unlock that and, and convince customers to pay the prices that, you know, you need to, to produce uh, at small scale, you know, a huge opportunity there for, for craft brewers. So, you know, we'll see. We'll see if the evolution, you know, I, I do think there's some demographic reasons too. I mean, always go back to the, the demographics and the data. You know, we're seeing the population age. That means they probably want lower ABV, a little bit lighter. Right. Um, so, you know, so maybe that's a trade down from a six, six and a half percent IPA to a four and a half percent lager. Okay, so a couple more questions, then I'll let you go because you're, you're heading home today, aren't you? I'm headed home back to, uh, back to Colorado today. Sadly, I wish I could stay longer. So you said... And again, I'm butchering your quote, but you said you're not in the beer industry. Um, and so when you look at the different beer options that are competing, would it be your advice for people to at least explore the idea of of, um, of looking at... So you have the ready to drinks, you have the... Um, um, the seltzers, like all that sort of stuff. Like, what, how does how does that all kind of work together? Yeah. The, so starting with the you know quote, you're not in the beer industry, you're in the beverage alcohol industry. I mean, you know, this starts from the basic insight that on a per capita basis, we don't drink that much more or less every year. So there's a certain amount of kind of consumption of beverage alcohol that's out there. And so if somebody's drinking more of one thing, they're drinking less of something else. Right. And so we can think about ourselves only in the beer industry, but what those other areas of beverage alcohol are doing affects beer. Um, and it's really important to keep in mind. And, you know, on your, on your other question, I try not to give advice. That's not my role, right? I try to give data and frame it for, for brewers so, so they can make these decisions themselves. And what, you know, what I would ask back to a brewer who was thinking about this is you know, questions about, you know, where do you want your business to go? What does your brand stand for? Yeah. You know, where are other opportunities? You know, because it's not just a lot of times we're, we're as humans, we're very good at kind of saying like, ooh, should I make this? As opposed to broadening out the question, what else could I make? That would make my business more successful, right. and and when you do that, you you suddenly see okay maybe the loggers that we just talked about is a better option for me. And you know in the end, this is going to depend on the brand. It's going to depend on your production capacity. It's going to depend on your knowledge. You know, for a, somebody who's traditionally done German loggers, 
making a you know crazy hard seltzer or you know an RTD maybe is not going to resonate with their customer. Doesn't right. mean you can't do it right, but then you got to think about okay, it's got to be a separate brand. I got to spin this off. It's got to have different you know branding. It's got to look you know completely different than what I do now. You know maybe that's more work, more cost, and so the equation doesn't work quite as well for me as opposed to well I've made you know pastry stouts or you know sour IPAs, and so like oh, the jump to, to to an RTD is not as big for my customer and I think it's going to fit. And I already see people ordering them. You know, I have, run a bar too and I see people ordering these side by side. Um, so I don't think there's a right answer. Um, I'd also, you know, say there's lots of other opportunities that aren't these that may fit better with some brewers. And at the end of the day, it's what do you want your business to be? And where, yeah. do, you, where do you see the opportunities and the costs? Where does non-alcohol uh, fit into that? Yeah, that's a great question too. You know, non-alk I think is certainly another opportunity we're seeing some brewers explore. Making non-alks is tough for a lot of small brewers, just you know, or, or making them so they taste okay. Right. Um, so, you know, how are you going to make them? Are you going to make them under contract? Are you going to actually, you know, pay for this equipment? How big do you think this market could be? I mean, that's a great example of a, a niche market that I think if you focus on, there's huge opportunities. And, you know, look at, look at athletic brewing in the United States. Yeah. They are crushing it, you know, and they're going to be, they're going to be a top 25 craft brewer in the United States out of nothing uh, because they have singularly focused on this kind of new consumer space of fuller flavor, but non elk, which yeah. really didn't exist. I mean, there were non elk beers, but they were, you know, kind of, <laughs> you know, shadows of the, of the macro lagers. And we've seen this new kind of craft space, you know, really get carved out, but it's, it's not for everyone. And it's not something where everyone is making a lot of money doing this. It's a few companies that have really focused on this said, this is where our brand sits. This is where our value proposition is. And, and they've been able to grow that successfully. So that's, that's a great illustration of kind of the, what do we want to be yeah. and what are we willing to kind of invest and focus on to make sure that we're successful there? So you've, you've been in Alberta for, for a couple of days. Um, you've, from my understanding, uh, d did you land in Calgary then? Landed in Calgary so and spent got, a couple of days there. Yeah, spent a couple of days there, um, and just doing you know obviously some research on Alberta before you got here. Is there are there things that that make Alberta different um, that might give breweries here reasons to be optimistic? Well, you know, I, I think I'd first start with you've got a you've got a strong economy and a growing population. And, you know, the growing population should not be discounted. You know, I said this in my talk, but if we, you know, Alberta has about 3 million working age adults right now. I think total population is 4.2 million, if I remember that right. Um, and it's going to move in the coming decades to 4 million uh, working age population. So right there, that's a 33% growth in the market, you know, assuming the distribution of those kind of new people looks, you know, like now, where you do nothing and the market is going to grow 33%, you know, in the coming <laughs> decades, uh, which is great. I mean, that's a huge reason for optimism and, and combat some of the stuff we talked about kind of Canada-wide and, and demographic decline. Um, you know, I think it's also just, uh, it's a new market um, in many ways, you know, that there's more developed craft markets in Canada, which, um, you know, creates challenges, right, in education and consumer education, but it creates opportunity too. When right. when the market doesn't have a definition of what it is, I think that creates more opportunities for companies to say, we're going to try something new and and see if it takes off and, and see opportunity there, which that's exciting. I mean, that's a fun fun place to be in um, as opposed to, you know, more mature markets where, you know, maybe the share is higher, but it's a little bit more competitive to fight for kind of every scrap of market space. Right. Um, yeah, no, I think it was just great. It was great to listen to you this morning and, to be able to sit here and just ask you questions. It's a unique skill set for someone to have the amount of knowledge you have, but be able to communicate it in a way that, uh, you know, the average human being can kind of digest because it's information that, that these business owners need to know. Um, and, um, and going and finding it and, and translating it into something that makes sense, you know, by yourself is not, easily done so so thank you for uh taking the time to to be with us i really appreciate that th th thanks for having me and i you know i wish i could go back and tell a uh, grad st grad school bard uh that i would be putting those skills to use doing something i'm so passionate about and so excited yeah. to be doing now no that's awesome thanks so much and um uh safe travels back to colorado wonderful thanks All for right. having me take care